Well, the Ock and Welsh. Um, I'm not speaking in Welsh entirely. I will be using some Welsh words, but I'll give you a translation. First of all, thank you very much for Sporting Heritage, for inviting me. I was pretty much a last minute substitute. If I can have a similar impact to Ross Mariotti last Sunday, I'll be quite pleased. <laughs> but, uh, somehow I don't think so. <laughs> right then, here we go. Give me a tour of Wales, an international heritage. What I'm going to do is give you a brief history and description of the tour with its dates, its main players, and a little bit about its current status. It is a bicycle race, it is for junior riders, and that junior riders is really important because it's uh, a prime reason why the race has developed the heritage it has. In cycling terms, a junior is someone between 16 and 18 years of age on the 1st of January every year, which in a junior race would mean that people would not normally ride more than three years in that category without dispensation, and usually they only ride two years in that category. That's, that's really important um, to know. So, this race, the Junior Tour of Wales, it uh, is held and was held originally in and around the borough of Blaine Gwent in Monmouthshire. For people who are maybe not familiar with the area, this is the Valleys of Wales going up from Cardiff. Uh, we're round about 25 miles from Cardiff down here say to Rasa up there. All the roads up are very, very difficult. They go like this and like this and like that. And the valleys are just what they said. The green areas are high ridges between the occupied valleys and the valleys are occupied primarily because of coal mining. This is the borough of Blaine Gwent as it exists. Uh, the three main towns are Tredega on the left there Ebel Vale and this town down here, Abitaleri. Abitaleri is much the least well known in national and international terms. Trinigar people associate with Nairam Bever and Ebel Vale with a huge steelworks and a massive Brexit vote, which we'll say no more about. <laughs> Abitaleri arguably was the most important mining town in the whole of South Wales for a very long time. It produced coal there of a very high quality which was used primarily for domestic purposes. In, at the end of the Second World War, the population of Abitaleri was just over 30,000. There was a population of maybe just 55,000 in the borough as a whole. Abitaleri is also the narrowest valley. So as you can see, it's probably got some geographical challenges. It was, as I said, the most intensively mined town, not only in South Wales, but the whole of Britain. Between Llanelleth in the south here and Cumtaleri there, which is a distance of under four miles, there were five working collieries as late as 1960. Uh, it's kind of quite difficult to talk about now, but that's the way it was, and it was quite an experience growing up there. Local culture developed very much along social and sporting lines in Abertilleri in many forms. Abertilleri Rugby Club were very, very powerful in the years before the First World War and up to the depression of the 1930s. Their prominence continued into the fact that the 1962 British Lions Tour saw three representatives from that one club out of a touring party of 32 people which is quite extraordinary when you think they picked from the whole of Great Britain. Um, there was, however, a very highly charged political atmosphere at times, and it perhaps reached its apex at the time of the 1926 general strike, and the extended miners' strike which followed, which is largely forgotten in Britain. The general strike lasted a week and the miners stayed out for many months afterwards. The events surrounding the erection and unveiling of the town's great war memorial were central to this. we we'll just move on, hopefully. There you go. This is Abertilleri looking up. This is a colliery in the village of Six Bells. You can see the way the houses are laid out. You can probably get an idea of the density that was going on in the valley. 
this colliery was to become very important because in 1960 the last major mining disaster in Great Britain happened there, an underground explosion and 46 men were killed. In the week when the uh, annual remembrance of the Aberfan disaster takes place, this disaster um, predated Aberfan but it was the last underground major loss of life in the whole of Britain. This is the town's war memorial. As you can see, it's very graciously laid out, re really well maintained. The event surrounding this war memorial, which wasn't the, uh, in fact unveiled until I say the latter days of 1926, was dramatic to put it mildly. There were rumors of uh, a communist plot to blow up the war memorial. It had an armed guard on it for three <coughs> months before it was actually unveiled. Mm and the government authorities sent down the highest ranking officer in the British Army, Field Marshal Viscount Lord Allenby, and about 400 troops to make sure there were no problems on the day. It says a lot about the mood of the population in Aberton area at that time, how they were moulded, and how their spirit of independence grew. Cycling had a permanent place in the town, however. There was a tarmac race track laid down in the town's park in the 1930s. It was regularly used, the highlight of the year being the local police sports, which drew competitors, <laughs> ironic really, the police sports, but it drew, co it drew competitors from all over Great Britain. And the War Memorial, or at least the area outside the War Memorial, was the meeting place for the local cycling club, the Abenslerian District <coughs> founded on the uh, armistice of the Second World War and still going. <coughs> now, I can argue that this spirit of adventure, independence and local pride was tantamount to the decision by John Richards to inaugurate the first Junior Tour of Wales in 1981. He called it the Junior Tour of Wales, though it barely left the area as I first indicated on the map. I guess he could have called it the um, Tour of Blaine Gwent and surrounding districts, but somehow <laughs> wouldn't have had the same impact. <laughs> um, anyway, John was encouraged by his own experience managing a team of Welsh juniors in the Tour of Ireland. Um, and he began the Junior Tour of Wales on an absolute wing and a prayer, without really being sure how he was going to pay for it, who was going to turn up who was going to turn up to help, etc., etc. But he found from day one absolutely no shortage of willing helpers from all manner of backgrounds. I'll go on now to outline its development and the parallel layers of history, of heritage, sorry, it engendered by the way of three separate editions. So the race began in 1981. The first winner was a Welsh boy, Stuart Coles, from the village of New Tredega, which was two valleys across from Abertillery. Stuart was one of the rising stars of British cycling, but he was also a total maverick. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. He passed away, I think, believe it was in Malaysia a few years ago. But he could have been a bigger star as anybody, but maybe with that valley spirit of bravado and independence, he chose a different path. Anyway, the 1987 edition included for the first time a breakaway from the roads of the industrial valleys with an excursion into the Vale of Usk. Once the race reached Brecon, for those of you who are not familiar, there is a steady climb of between seven and eight miles to Story Arms, which is on the road to Merthyr. It's very, very high and a very, very gradual climb. At the time, I was simply reporting the race for Cycling Weekly, but I did sit in the car behind the race and watch things develop. As a personality and a star in the making in the form of 16-year-old Matt Stevens, who latterly became British professional champion and is now one of the chief commentators on Eurosport. Stevens, who came from Hertfordshire, broke away and won the race after his... his uh, ascent of this climb and he effectively opened the door for others to come to this remote forbidding part of the world you know but a very welcoming part of the world at the same time 
to an increasingly widespread clientele. We'd already had riders over from Ireland, but now there was much more interest coming from the English side because Stevens was a name known in, in British and particularly English circles. Right, the race went on. In 1996, we had a real breakthrough when it moved from its traditional date at the back end of July to August bank holiday weekend which allowed the race to expand from two days to three days. And it was over a bank holiday weekend, which freed up more time for parents, helpers, etc., to come down. The 1999 edition saw for the first time the, partition of a team, the, sorry, the participation of a team from the continent. And they were from the cycling heartland of the Flanders region of Belgium. For anybody in the room who knows a little bit about cycling, uh, uh, they won't need any introduction. All I can say is the Flanders region of Belgium is as important to cycling as County Durham is to the development of English footballers. Um, you name it, you know, it's, it's that much. The Belgians brought with them another star in the making in the form of Johan von Summeren. He won the race, he went on to complete nine editions of the Tour de France, and his greatest day came when he won the most important single day in the race in the world, which is the race from Paris to Roubaix. This goes over the cobbles of northern France and just creates mayhem and destruction all the way. That lay ahead of him and it was to make him a world star. It was clear to all by this time, but maybe especially to John Richards and myself, I devolved into the role of race commentator by this time. We were in the car at the front of the race with a very loud, loud speaker on the car letting everybody know what was happening. Maybe I was the right person, but uh, <laughs> it worked. Anyway, um, we were well aware that something very unique and very profound was happening with the Junior Tour. It was still existing on a financial wing and a prayer John had gone virtually bankrupt on three occasions, finding the money to pay everybody at the end of it. And he didn't receive any meaningful support at all from the British Cycling Federation generally or any other sources in the cycling world. It did, however, have a rock solid base behind it in the form of Blaine Gwent Borough Council. Their unwavering and logistic and log logistical uh, financial and logistical support underpinned the tour year after year. It wasn't just the money, it was the fact that they were enabling us to use a school for the race's headquarters. They were enabling us to do all the photocopying, etc., etc., for no charge. They would also send out people employed by the Borough Council to help us with the marshalling on the roads and so on. You can't add it up in money. And that council was the council of the people of the area. In other words, they were continuing the, the heritage of the area by welcoming people in to support this race, which was starting to become an international event. So the unwavering support of this council um, underpinned it year on year. And this was despite their difficulties in administering a district that regularly appeared and still appears in the bottom five of Britain's most deprived areas and showed little signs of recovering from the loss of over 10,000 jobs in the mining and steelworking industries in the preceding 25 years. Just perhaps a redefinition of heritage was being forged by the council's action. Right, i just move on with my pictorials. Sorry about the fingers. That's Matt Stevens. I'm sorry about the poor quality of the, pay, of the um, reproduction. That's the great Johan von Summeren winning the Paris Roubaix race. <laughs> and I'll move on to this chap in a minute. The 2005 edition has gone down in collective memory as being a fulcrum of the tour's development, legacy, and heritage. The previous year, 2004, had seen an almighty duel in the race between two riders who are now at the absolute peak of their powers in world cycling, namely Dan Martin, who rides for Ireland even though he's a Brummie, and 
need I mention it, Geraint Thomas. Just a few seconds separated them at the finish, with one particularly memorable stage climaxing on the mountain road between Bryn Mawr and Blaenavon. And that was just outside of the pub kept by a member of the Welsh team in the 1958 Empire Games. Ron Roach, his name is, he keeps a pub called the Racehorse. It's nothing to do with racehorses. Race is actually the name for a pond from which the, the, the ironworks would store their uh, water supply. And the horse was the poor beast who had to draw trucks around it, etc. <laughs> Nevertheless, Ron has put up a, a picture of a racehorse outside. Anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a curious, there's a curious um, heritage connection there. I did some writing a few years back for a magazine for the um, Veteran Cycle Club where I actually talked about the story of the 1958 Empire and Commonwealth Games in Cardiff. And we've had mention of that earlier on today when we were talking about Cardiff's heritage. This race was utterly remarkable. It was the first time a road had been fully closed in Britain to allow a cycle race to take place. <coughs> It wasn't in Cardiff, it was just down the road between um, Southern Down and Ogmore by the Sea. An astonishing race, it was held on a Saturday morning, 150 police had to turn out to marshal the road, totally accident free, and needless to say there was a hell of a row at the end between the English and Australians about who cheated and who hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie Roach was in the race, I'll come back to that later. So there's a connection, and there for one gentleman who in the audience who's interested is the first mention of a pub. Um, good as it was, however, the battle that raged in 2005 between Alex Dowsett, who was member of the Glendean CC, who were an Essex-based team, who brought in the best British junior riders, people from the Isle of Man, people from the Midlands, people from Wales, went to ride for the Glendean. They became a kind of British All-Stars team and they went abroad regularly, etc, etc. And they battled in this race with, for the first time, a Norwegian squad who came over with no financial strings attached, paid full whack, top hotels the lot, because they brought with them a rider tip to become a world star, which he did, in the name of Edvald Bosenhagen, who originally rode for the Sky Team and now rides for the Dimension did a South African team. The battle proved even more intense and significant. This is a photo of Alex winning stage four, three, sorry, and he's actually winning it right outside the pub that John Richards now keeps, which is called the Prince of Wales, and it's on the road between Tredega and Rumney. Got it. Five minutes. We're going to make it. <laughs> as quick as Alex gets up the mountain. Um, it's incorrectly on the website for the tour and say winning on top of the tumble. It's not. It's actually looking back there, and John's pub is on the right hand side. They've got five minutes. I think I'll beat the clock here. <laughs> right. So that team came over, but they found the Glen Dean <coughs> had the financial backing, shrewd experience, management, ambition, and it must be said this key word of joyfulness. They epitomised the heritage that the tour has developed and established. And I found this articulated in the memoirs of the great French writer Laurent Fignon. He had no connection with Junior Tour whatsoever. He did win the Tour de France twice and was famously beaten by eight seconds in 1989. The key is the title of his book, We Were Young and Carefree which epitomised the whole mood of this semi-anarchic state of the tour going along without any official backing at all. So the last thing I'm going to talk about with the tour is the linkage with, and I'm going to use a Welsh word here, Kinevin. It's spelled C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. The tour's linkage with the Kinevin of Abitaleri. I love this Welsh word. It relates to a sense of harmony and belonging. A belonging with all the elements of a landscape, a natural history, and a people in a particular locality. From this I claim that the tour would have quite probably failed to have taken root anywhere else, never mind lasting now for the best part of 40 years, 
It is not definable, just as the translation of Kinevin is unframable in any other language apart from Welsh, but manifested by the natural and human elements of the town and its environment. With that, apart from a short note to say that I can't escape the junior tour, I was recently approached by somebody in Bill Bay, or for heaven's sake, <laughs> whose son had written, written the tour eight years ago and wanted to remember it. So there you go. <laughs> That's the junior tour of Wales. There's obviously enough there to keep us going till this time next week. But I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention again.